Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, let me make sure we're shared. So I want to share your screen here, Cash. Great. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. We are about to start the Emporium Model, Introduction to the Emporium Model, presented by Cash Clifton. This is our first annual virtual conference, 2017. As we watch people start getting on to the seminar, we ask that you go to the tinyurl.com, seen on the first slide here on your screen. It's tinyurl.com backslash DELTVC2017. This will get you registered for this specific session and allow us to have access to your email account should you require or request any additional resources or support. So go ahead and do that when you can. I also want to let you know that after Cash Clifton is done with this presentation, we will have a 10-minute question and answer period. So I'll be monitoring the chat, and we'll share those questions that you have with him at the time. All right, Cash, take it away. All right, can you hear me now, Faith? Perfect. Well, like as Faith said, welcome to the first annual New Mexico DELT uh, virtual conference 2017. And I am going to be speaking with you this afternoon about the Emporium model. Um, the Emporium model is a model of teaching mathematics. It is um, conducive to hybrid or blended learning, although it is not um, recommended for online uh, learning. So ju just please be aware going into this. Um, this is a method that requires um, an element of face-to-face -face meeting. So em Emporium means different things at different institutions. Um, I, I don't think there's a uh, great consensus as far as exactly what Emporium is. So today we're going to be looking at one um, particular model of Emporium education. Um, this is one that I chose because there, it seems to have the most research in terms of effectiveness. So um, around the country, we're, we're seeing a lot of success um, with this kind of model. And so um, these are the NCAT, um, the 10 essential elements of the Emporium model. Green for you, though I won't read them to you because we're going to go through them um, individually in a fair amount of detail. So here again, these are the 10 essential elements and we're going to break down and look at these in detail. So core concepts. The idea here with Emporium is that the student learns by doing math rather than watching you do math. So the, this um, very much um, flies in the face of, of a traditional classroom where you lecture, you give some independent practice, and then you assess um, the student. This largely removes um, the lecture component. The, the focus is on having your students um, be active uh, learners actually doing the math themselves. And part of the important concept is that progression is self-paced, although you do structure um, what that self-pacing looks like. So, well, let's look at this in, um, in some more detail. So, element number one, um, that's where we re design the whole course sequence and establish um, greater uh, course consistency. So, as, as I referenced before, this is a very um, different way of learning math, and it may require some rethinking of the course sequence um, at your institution. Rather than um, de defining mastery as, okay, you, you set in my class for 15 weeks or however long you, you completed the class, the focus is on mastery um, before they progress. So you give a student a unit. Let's say that unit takes student A two weeks. You let them move on to the next material in the third week. Um, if student B needs to take 20 weeks on the material, you keep them in that material for 20 weeks and you move them on um, to the next unit week 21. So it's, it's very much this idea of you don't move forward until you've mastered the current skill set, which I, I, I think is, is very good for a math class. It's very much on um, individualized learning. You it is set up so that every student is moving at their own pace. That means if you have a class of 30 students, you may have 30 students um, working on 30 unique topics at any given time. 
um, one of the, one of the standards here is that you want consistency throughout the entire um, course sequence. So if a student starts in a low level of math under the Emporium model, you want them to be able to move to the moderate level of math and still have Emporium. You want to be able to move to the more advanced um, level of math and still have that Emporium option as, as they do get um, very comfortable with it over time. So that's our, the first of our 10 elements. So now we're going to look at element two, which is that you require active learning and ensure that students are actually doing math. So your class time um, isn't so much focused on a lecture, although there can be a mini depending on the particular Emporium model you're looking at. But the focus is on having your students actually in a system um, practicing doing the math. If you joined me earlier for our Ed Ready conference, Ed Ready is a particularly um, excellent program for, for this kind of model. This is learner-centered learning. It's self-directed learning. This, this is empowering the student. This is telling the student to take control of their own learning trajectory. You're, you're there more as a partner in the learning process. Um, you're, you're still the authority um, in the classroom. You still enforce behavioral standards. You still express expectations. But as far as the student's actual um, learning trajectory, uh, as far as how quickly they're going to progress, what they're working on at a given time, um, the student has a lot of input on that. It's not just you as the teacher um, teaching everyone the same content. As part of this, you want to teach study skills. You, you want to teach the students how to actually be a good student. Um, you might want to introduce them to some basic concepts of learning theory and just let them know, hey, this, this is how you, you, you be a good student. I mean, it's, I, I think it's easy to assume that students know how to be a student, but they, they don't always. Um, my, my very first semester um, doing Emporium, I, I didn't address this um, last point very well. You want group activity to build community. So I, I did um, my first semester in the Emporium model back in the fall of 2015. Uh, gave all the students a survey, and the students really liked that way of learning math. Um, I, I had many students who said um, that they, they were not successful in your more traditional math instruction formats that were very successful here. So for the most part, the students liked it, but the feedback they gave me is they said they felt very alone. Um, they felt very disconnected from me as the teacher. They felt very uh, disconnected from their classmates. And so you want to have some group activities um, to build community. So the way, the way I structure my class is once a week, I have small group discussions. So for example, yesterday, I had a small group discussion. And the topic was, what is stressing you out? And I asked each student to share with their group what has you stressed in life right now? And then the group tried to come up together um, with solutions. And so there's a there's a lot of little activities uh, like that you can do. Um, I am willing to share the uh, the activities that I do in my classroom. I have a set of 15 um, different activities. So we're doing a different activity each week throughout the semester, and I'm happy to share that. Um, please shoot me an email at the, at the end of this session if you would like to see um, sort of what those look like. Uh, element number three, you need to hold a class in a computer lab or classroom using um, commercial instructional software. So this will not work in a traditional uh, classroom. Your students need to have access to some sort of device, whether it's a computer, a tablet, um, something. And you need some sort of computer software um, to help you out with that. So. I recommend uh, NM Delta Ed Ready, so that's nmdelt.edready.org, and we do have training available on that if you're not familiar with it. Um, Plato is another program that, that could work well for this type of model, and that is available uh, free of charge through NM Delt to those programs that are HED funded. There's also, in terms of a free program, uh, Khan Academy program, although I personally am a bit partial to Ed Ready. There are also things available for pay. Um, they're, they're quite pricey, but, but they are good programs. Um, Alex and Connect Math, those are McGraw-Hill products, and my Math Lab is a Pearson product. If you are going to look at paying for some sort of program, I um, 
I, I am slightly more fond of Alex than my math lab for these purposes. Although keep in mind, Ed Ready is probably um, your best bet. It's it's high quality in terms of the instruction provided, and hey, it's free to you. Who who doesn't like free? Element number four, you want to modularize um, your course materials and your course structure. So you, so you want to have kind of breaks um, in the material when you do um, some sort of testing. So you have, um, you have online tutorials in there. Um, this is essentially so that students can self-teach themselves uh, to some extent. So lo looking at Ed Ready, um, there are videos in there that can help the student learn. There are uh, text instructions, um, little diagrams, help the student learn. And you want to have that piece in there where, where the program is available to help the student learn the material. Now, is it only the computer that does the teaching? Um, by, by no means. Um, you still, uh, you as the instructor, you still go around and you provide instruction. You may provide group mini lectures. And it's essentially what I tell my students is try the lesson in EdReady. Working for you, raise your hand and call me over, and then we can go over um, whatever the lesson is one on one. This is not uh, conducive to pen and paper learning. So, if, if you're thinking in terms of um, have students work from a textbook, uh, something more traditional like that, um, Emporium model is probably not the way to go. And don't get me wrong, I, I don't want to trash the, the traditional teaching methods. I, I think they're still um, very effective, but but in the context of, of Emporium, um, pen and paper learning is, is not going to be the way to go. That said, as the students are working through a program, um, I do suggest you have them take notes. And, and as part of this process, you're teaching them um, note-taking skills. A uh, word of caution is don't try to cram in a full lecture. Don't try to get up in front of your students and talk for 45 minutes. Keep in mind the focus here is on having them actually in the math, working on the material, getting in there, struggling, missing problems, and learning from that kind of thing. Uh, mini lectures, I, I know several teachers who like to use uh, mini lectures in class. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sparing with the mini lectures. Uh, what I'll do is if I notice I have several students on the same topic, if I have several students asking the same question, I'll, I'll get the whole group's attention. I'll say, hey, I'm going to do a little lecture on this over here at the board. Come join me if you want to, and I make that entirely optional. Um, I know other instructors that require the mini lectures, and so that comes down somewhat to your teaching style. The challenge um, related to requiring a lecture is if you have every single student in your classroom working on different material, that, that's going to be kind of difficult. Um, you're going to have a group of students that um, you'd be lecturing right to their level, but you're going to have a group that are behind, and so your lecture's over their head. You're also going to have groups uh, that are ahead, and they're bored because they already know the material. So, so be, um, be, be careful about how, how you use those mini lectures if you go forward to it. And class time should not be spent um, going over homework. So you still have homework uh, in this model. So what I do in my classes is I require the students to meet in class face-to-face uh, -face for two and a half hours a week, and then I require a minimum of three hours per week outside of class, so I should be seeing five and a half hours uh, per week spent in Ed Ready. If students have a hard time, if they struggle on a topic in the homework, um, I am willing to go over that with them, but this is on a this is a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's not standing in front of the class um, taking homework questions like, um, like you would in a more um, traditional setting. And you do want to have the option to complete uh, multiple courses uh, per semester, and I put courses there in quotation marks. So what we've done in NM Delta Ed Ready is we have created curriculum that aligns with the NRS levels. So we have six different levels um, in there. And so for example, if a student completes NRS level one math, um, within five weeks, you know, don't don't say, oh, you have to wait until the next semester or the next round of courses. Get them onto the next level um, right away, and and just let them work work as far forward. Um, again, this is self-paced uh, learning. Um, so the fifth element here is requiring um, mastery learning. So you want to have frequent um, assessment to identify deficiencies. Uh, Ed Ready is is nice because you um, you start out you give the student an assessment it identifies the math they know it identifies the math they don't know and it builds them a customized 
learning path um, based on what they are ready to learn next. As part of the Emporium model, you want to frequently reassess. So the way we set up Ed Ready is that as you move a student on to the next NRS level of math, there's some review built in there. It's going to go back, it's going to retest them. And if they forgot, for example, how to add fractions, even if they mastered it the first time around, the second time around, that may pop back up if they forgot it. And it's, it's really about filling in those, those gaps on learning. Um, you want to have some sort of adaptive um, assessment built in, and that, that's one area where, where EdReady um, isn't quite as strong as I would like it to be yet. But the idea here is this adaptive assessment to identify, okay, this is what you know, we don't need to spend our time working on what you already know. This is what you don't know. We really want to focus on, on what you need to learn and, and really remove that, um, that busy work component. And I've, I've found if, if you introduce the concept to students like that, they, they, their ears kind of perk up in the idea of, oh, oh hey, I, I don't have to do all the busy work and relearn these things um, that I already know. As already uh, referenced, we have built some curriculum uh, that aligns with the CCRS and NRS standards, uh, the Ed Ready webinar that I did earlier um, this morning. Um, we went over that in a little bit more detail. If anybody would like the link to see what that curriculum looks like, uh, please shoot me an email. I'd, I'd be happy to um, to share it with you. We, we just um, have it saved in Google Sheets, and I, I can share that link with you. There is no moving on to the next module uh, without demonstrating mastery. So a student goes through, they complete NRS level one, and then they take some sort of assessment. You need to have some sort of standard identified in terms of you have to score this on the assessment to be able to move forward. So I've said it's a 75%. Um, if the student cannot get 75% on the assessment, I say you don't know, you need to go back in, you need to do an another initial diagnostic assessment, and you need to work through this material again. The student gets at least a 76%, that's where I let them move on to the next round of material. Now, 76%, you, you may be thinking that that seems like sort of a low standard, but keep in mind that 24% that they may have missed is going to be reassessed in your next module. So, so there, there's that repetition um, built in. So even if they miss a little bit in RS level one, they're going to see it again in, in RS level two. So again, um, the student cannot move forward to the next module until they demonstrate mastery. And that's... um. That's, in my opinion, a, a big piece of why this Emporia model is, is so successful. You, you think of how math builds on itself. This is designed so that, no, you, you can't move on to step two unless you have that nice, solid foundation of, of step one in place. And it's also going back to check, okay, well, you, you mastered this piece from step one, but now you've forgotten it. Let's go back and go over it again. That's that's where the, this individualized learning is um, is really great. So typically, um, mastery is defined as seventy five percent to ninety um, percent of the material. That's sort of um, the the standard for this Emporium model. Again, I I go more for seventy five. You want to you want to build in ongoing assessment, and you want to build in prompt feedback. You want that immediate um, feedback. This is one thing that I consider an advantage over over traditional uh, lecture classrooms. A traditional lecture classroom, the student turns in the homework. Time to grade the homework. You finally get the homework back to them. They may have forgotten quite a bit in the in the few days to a week that it took to get that feedback back to them. And that's the advantage of, of using these online um, programs such as EdReady and Alex is the computer is able to give them immediate feedback. There is no waiting while it's still fresh in the student's mind. They're able to identify, hey, this is something I missed and go back and, and fix those gaps in their knowledge. You do want some sort of proctored um, post-testing, so you don't want the student just to be able to, to work on their own. You, you want to have some sort of system in place where you can verify that this is the actual student um, doing the work. Um, you, you sort of want these nets in place to make sure they're not getting too much help from Big Brother or from their friend down the street or their neighbor or whoever it may be. Um, TABE or whatever um, assessment your program is using can be a great way to um, proctor. Like I said, computer-based assessment, you have that immediate feedback, which is really great. Um, Ed Ready gives you the immediate feedback. Uh, Plato, for those who are using Plato, gives you immediate um, feedback. There is G Suite. Um, if you joined us earlier for the discussion of G Suite, there is this add-on 
called Flubberoo, where you can sort of build your own assessments uh, through Google Forms. And then Flubberoo is the program that can provide the students that, that immediate feedback that's so necessary here in the Emporium model. And as I've been referencing throughout, um, as you're doing this com continuous assessment, there's remediation when necessary. It's, it's interesting to me how students can get can move on to something advanced like like quadratic equations. And when they get in, they're working the quadratic equations, they may realize, oh, I forgot how to add fractions. Well, this is building that element of, okay, let's go back and add fractions because you need that skill to be able to do the current task. Our seventh element, um, you want to provide students with one-on-one -on, -one, um, on demand from highly trained personnel. So to, to borrow um, a phrase from the literature, um, rather than thinking of yourself as a lecturer, you're more of an on-demand tutor. So you have students in a lab, they're all working, um, you're telling the students to raise their hand, to notify you when they want your assistance. Um, and sometimes you have to be kind of pushy with your tutoring. Sometimes I'll see a student stuck on the same topic, the same topic I see they keep missing things. And that's where I may go up and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I, I have an alternate way of doing that. Would you like to see it? Hey, I noticed you've been on that for a few minutes. Can I help you out? Do you want to work through one together? It's difficult for students to, to hide in the corner, um, so to speak. So you're very much um, working there as a tutor. You, you want to have um, tutors in class and out of class if your program is designed for that. Um, I've had better luck in classes where I can have a tutor um, physically in the room with me. I've found there are some students who are more comfortable going to the teacher for help. There's other students who are more comfortable um, going to the tutor for help. That also gets them to start developing a relationship with the tutors so that hopefully they're more comfortable um, seeking out that tutor on their own outside of class. Um, again, this is active learning. You really want to encourage the students to speak up. You really want to encourage them to not um, sit there and suffer in silence, because some of them will. Um, you know, make them feel like part of a learning community. I, I do that with the discussions um, that I referenced earlier, but really try to build um, that collaboration. So I'll, I'll tell you guys what the discussions Usually the first week or two, I, I feel like a dentist um, trying to pull people's teeth without any kind of numbing. They're, they're very, very resistant to the group discussions um, the first couple of weeks. By about the eighth or ninth week, I have the opposite problem. I'm struggling to reel the discussions in. They're having a really great discussion of study skills. They're having a really great discussion of um, stressors. They're having a really good discussion about their support system, and I have to reel them in and say, okay, it's it's time to move um, move on back to the math. But an advantage of, of that learning community as, as they get to know each other is I've noticed students will assist each other quite a bit. Um, I'll see student A who really struggled on a topic for a long time, but they finally got it. If they notice that student B is struggling with the same thing, Maybe I'm clear across the room helping somebody out. They'll jump on and help the student. And, and we all know how that, how that reinforces um, long-term memory to, to actually teach the material to someone else. So cre creating, that, creating that community, I, I think, is so important. And you just don't want your students to feel like they're stuck on a computer um, completely isolated from all humanity. Eighth element, you want to ensure sufficient time on task, and this one can be a bit of a challenge. As I said earlier, um, I require three hours per week logged in the system uh, working outside of class, and that is quite a battle um, with many of my students. I tend to just make those conversations. I, I pull them out into the hallway. I have them come uh, sit down with me in my office and say, hey, I noticed you didn't log in outside of class. What's going on with that? What's this plan to get you move forward and, and really teaching the students that, that it's it's about that persistent. It's it's persistence. It's um it, it's not about just being this this great genius in, in the subject. Um, so you have the, the group and the individual discussion of study habits. So we have the group activities. I also require students to meet with me one-on-one uh, -on -one a couple of times per semester. And when we have those one-on-one -on -one meetings, so I say, hey, what are your study habits like, and, and that kind of thing. And those, um, those are some very productive um, conversations for me. Depending on the program you use, you can um, get it to display charts that, uh, that show you uh, study habits students. 
And my students really uh, tend to respond well to this. They can see, oh, look, I had a gap right there where I didn't log into the system for six days. And that's when I can look at them and say, well, and, and what happened you know, during that gap? And they, they typically tell me, well, I, I forgot quite a bit. And then I, I can steer the conversation, say, okay, well, let's let's make a plan for more consistency. I mean, do you do you think do you want to set a goal of logging in every day? Do you want to set a goal of logging in four days a week? I mean, how how do you want to structure this? And that's that's really um, getting the student to take take charge of of their own learning and, and be more active in that process. I um I do learning plans um, with my students, so I do what are called um, study plans. So anytime a, a student doesn't meet the requirement for um, time in the system working, we develop a written document um, called the study plan. And that's where I do things like have them create a schedule um, where we talk about, okay, where can you go if you get stuck? And, and really just individualizing those, but having the students think the long term and thinking, okay, how, you know, where do I want to be as a student? And um, what, are, what are the concrete steps that I'm going to take? Uh, to get there. I do um, require weekly attendance in person um, based on what I've seen in the literature. If you're not going to require weekly attendance, you're wasting your time um, with Emporium. One of, one of the dangers with this model is there is the potential there for students to procrastinate indefinitely. It's not a, a standard class where I'm saying, okay, this assignment is due on this day, no, they're just more in the system um, working. And that required weekly attendance uh, gives you a chance to check in with students on those things. You definitely want to have an expectation um, to work outside of class. Now, here in New Mexico, we always um, have students having access to technology, um, students having access to internet. Even if they do have access to internet, they're, um, they're, they may have a very, very um, slow connection. I, I know my parents are in a rural eastern New Mexico and the, the best internet they can get out there is equivalent to dial-up. So I, I know we have a lot of students in these areas. Um, there are some options where they can download um, materials. So there, there are some things that you can do, um, but you definitely want to be talking with the students about what is their plan. Um, and part of that plan may require having open lab hours at your facility where students can come in and have access to, to computers and, and devices and, and the internet at your facility to, um, to work outside of class. And that could be nice too, um, having them come to the facility to do work because then um, they can forge the, those nice relationships with your tutors and your um, support staff. You wanna coach your students on time management skills and, and you know speak to the elephant in the room that this, this model allows a lot of uh, potential for procrastinating. I, um, I tend to have my students do time management through Google Calendar. Um, they can go in there, they can color code things, they can set themselves reminders. And, you know, have them sit down and say, oh, okay, what, what are your obligations to your family? And, and when are you going to do those obligations? And what are your obligations to yourself? And when, when are you going to do this? Okay, now where does math fit in here? Where can you commit to working on math? At what time? Where are you going to do it? What do you need for help? Um, you want to monitor uh, student progress and intervene when necessary. So I like to do a suggested schedule. So for example, if um, I'm starting with a low level class, I'm putting a student in NRS level one, I'm gonna have some kind of schedule as far as, okay, you need to try to master this many topics per week so that you can finish NRS level one in the class. And I, and I really try to be straightforward and say, okay, this, this is the minimum pace you need to keep. This is the minimum schedule. And I really encourage them to go faster, but sometimes they do go slower. But you, you definitely want to um, be, be setting those expectations in terms of, I, I do expect to, expect to see progression. I do expect you to be um, self-monitoring how you're moving forward. You wanna have, um, you wanna have constructive assessment to help you um, realize when to intervene. So for example, sometimes I'll, I'll see, I'll, I'll use Alex for this example. Um, I'll see a student that, that I, I look at their progress and they're mastering 10 topics per hour, which is, I'm, I mean, that's almost unheard of. They're, they're getting in there, they're doing topics, they're never missing a topic, it's just bam, 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 knocking them out. I give a student a proctor test and they get 10% on the material that they just knocked out like it was nothing. 
that tells me they're probably getting too much outside help. That tells me something is not right here. And you just want to have these systems in place to recognize when students are either, in some cases, they're, they're trying to cheat the system, or in other cases, maybe they just don't realize that they aren't doing enough of the work themselves. So definitely have these, these things in, in, um, in place. You, you want to have consistent contact with your students. So I, I have my students come to class twice per week. I like that consistent contact. I suggest at a minimum that you want to have your students physically in class at least once per week. That way you can be checking in on them. Um, and when you when you have that that face to face contact, that's when you want to follow up on the goal setting activities. You you create these nice study plans. You set these nice goals. You don't want it to be just some piece of paper that they stick in a file somewhere and never look at it again. You you don't want it to be something that just goes in their drive, um, never be opened again. You want to you want to follow up. Say hey, how how are you doing um, towards towards reaching those goals? And recognizing when students are just flat out stuck. Um, I, I don't think this model works for all students. I, I, I think you have to have a, a certain degree of intrinsic motivation to be able to work on your own there. And so recognizing when, when a student is just really floundering and then talking about what kind of options um, you might have uh, for those students and explicitly state what is due each week. Um, so for my class, I don't make a minimum number of topics due. I don't want to pressure the students to feel to move too quickly if they feel stuck on something. So what's due each week for my class is five and a half hours per week um, time on task in the system. So just ha having those minimum expectations um, very, very clear. You want to measure um, learning completion and cost. This one I'll go through pretty quickly. A, a lot of this is more um, shares and teachers, but you know, how can you make your class better. I give my students an anonymous survey. At the end of the semester, I give my students an anonymous survey in the middle of the semester. And I just want to know, hey, how are we doing? How is the class working? What is the class like um, from your perspective? And, and for the most part, I, I get very, very um, in, insightful answers. And I, I go back to my students after the mid-semester survey and I say, hey, based on the survey, I found out that you guys don't like this. I found out this isn't working for you guys. So here's how I'm going to try it differently. Does anybody have any ideas of something you think might work better? Again, the students take that ownership of, of their learning process. Um, you know, review the data from the learning software. You're, you're probably going to be doing this uh, for reporting purposes anyway. But kind of what, what sort of trends do you see? Do you see certain topics a lot of students are getting stuck on? If so, that might be a good time to do mini, a mini lecture on that topic, you know, discuss the assessment results within um, your department, of course, make data informed decisions. I think that's all pretty standard to, um, to good teaching practice. So, so those are the 10 essential elements um, for this Emporium model. Now I want to look at what does the teacher actually do? Well, as the teacher, you're there to guide the students. You're there to help them make these plans. You're there to help them when they get stuck. You're there to help them recognize um, you help the students avoid common pitfalls. Um, sometimes they go around and say, as you go through this, you'll start to see consistent mistakes that students are making and help them say, hey, you know, I see a lot of students do this in this section, you know, try to be mindful of not doing that. Or I see uh, one conversation I had this week is I said, okay, it's the middle of the semester. I tend to see motivation in my classes drop. This time of the semester, let, let's talk about the elephant in the room and, and hopefully avoid those sort of pitfalls. Um, uh, again, to, bar to borrow um, the uh, somebody else's uh, wording, think of yourself as a tutor in the trenches, a tutor on the ground helping the students with this math material, and encourage them to work outside of class. Um, what can you do to get your students motivated and using their time outside of class to actually work on the material. Um, you are going to facilitate and moderate the assessment. Again, you need some sort of assessment piece built in here that is uh, uh, proctored. You want to prepare relevant discussion topics, um, a lot of different directions you can take that in. You want to prepare mini lectures, although, although keep in mind um, you're using those very, very sparingly. Just a quick reminder there, this is a very different way of teaching and learning mathematics. So lots of, lots, lots of um, differences compared to what you may be used to. 
Um, the key difference is for teachers, um, there's minimal lesson planning. So you're not sitting down doing a, a Madeline Hunter style lesson plan because you're not doing a lecture. All of your students are at different places. That said though, you need to know your content really, really well. If you struggle with the quadratic formula, if you're used to reviewing that really thoroughly the day before the lecture on the quadratic formula, you're not going to have that luxury here necessarily. So you need to be able to go in there, and if you have a student at this very low level, you need to be ready to teach them at that very low level. If you have this student over here at a very high level, you need to be ready to provide quality instruction at that high level as well. If you get into something you're a little rusty at, I suggest just be honest with the student. Don't don't try to be um, disgenuine with them. There's um, no hand grading of homework. That's that's quite nice. It's um it's all graded um, within the computer. There's minimal time preparing and grading tests. Um, if you're using EdReady, those are going to be graded for you automatically. Um, tutors in class, if your program can swing it, that's really nice. Um, although that can that can introduce some challenges to the classroom dynamic as well, having both the teacher um, and the tutor in there, you you need to have some sort of boundary um, system in place as far as what's the teacher's role as opposed to what's the um, tutor's role. You want to be sure you're tracking participation and, and you know talking to those students who aren't logging in outside of class and what can you do, and you want to ensure student computer sure they understand the very basics of using a mouse, of using a keyboard, of typing their answer in the answer section, which I think is a quite usable skill considering um, most programs are doing um, the, the HSE tests on computer. So that'll be one less thing for the students to stress about when it comes time to actually take the test. So how is this different for students? And I want to think my students over the last couple of years because I have been asking them how is this different from your perspective so a lot of what I'm about to share with you is from the actual students mouth um, this is computer-based assessment and learning that may be very very different um, to your students especially your non-traditional populations there's no faking it um, I think a lot of students are were in the habit in high school of going to math class, um, avoiding the word problems. Well, it's okay. I can still get a B and skip all the word problems. No, that's that that's not an option anymore. Um, as they go through the modules, as they work towards testing, they 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 need to do all of it. And and hopefully in the end, that that's going to help them so that they don't have these gaps in their knowledge. The students are accountable. Um, they're accountable to themselves because because of the self-paced format. It's a very active process. They're accountable um, to the instructor as, as you have these conversations about how they're progressing. But th this is an interesting one that my students pointed out. They, um, they told me they feel more accountable to their peers. So as we have these group discussions or, of what are your stressors and what are your goals, apparently they will hold each other's feet to the fire and follow up with one another and say, hey, how are you doing towards your goal? You said, you mentioned to me after class last week that, that you were going to put all this time in Ed Ready. Did you do it? So that, that was one thing that, that really surprised me from my students' perspectives. They, they feel more accountable to each other. Um, students may not be used to active learning. They, they may be used to at a desk, having the teacher dump some knowledge in their head, and then being on their way. Well, that is absolutely not what happens in here. It can be different for students to uh, discuss success skills. Um, so they may have had teachers get up and lecture about success skills. They may have been to workshops learning about success skills. But in this case, they're actually talking to one another about success skills. They're actually telling you as the teacher about success skills. And, and students tell me that, that that feels very foreign. Um, their study habits are tracked. It, it's pretty frequent. I, I look at a student and I'll see they haven't really worked outside of class. So they do their two and a half hours in class. They did half an hour um, outside of class for a total of three hours for the week. So I pull them outside of class and I say, hey, I see you didn't meet um, the requirement for time in the system and oftentimes they'll look at me and say what no i i worked my rear off i worked so hard i bet i put 17 hours into the system but and i can pull it up and, and 
no, 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 you didn't. And one of two things I, I think is happening there, I, either they're trying to pull my leg, I, I think they genuinely aren't aware of that. Uh, math is, is such a, a difficult subject for them that that 30 minutes that they spent working in it may may have legitimately felt like three hours because it was just that miserable. And and that that's a good conversation to have with a student. Um, and one one thing that, that really surprised me is this idea, and, and keep in mind this is for my students, that the sky is the limit. If, if I want to go through three levels of math in 15 weeks, man, I can do it. Um, we had a student a couple of weeks ago concerned that she was spending too much time in the program, that she was going to get in trouble. And no, no, that, that is absolutely what we encourage. And, and so you will have those students that, that spend, you know, 20, 30 hours a week in the program just because they realize, hey, there, there are no um, stop signs in your path. So that is my presentation. Emporium involves a lot uh, more than I can possibly cover in 40 minutes here. So Faith, do we have any questions? We did have a few comments. Um, just to go back to the first part, Tina had shared that Sal Khan is a partner with NROC and with EdReady. So if that's the curriculum tool that you use with an Emporium model, you may see some of his videos in the EdReady. And there was um, generated a lot of excitement in the chat around that. And then um, Tina also mentioned that some of the EdReady videos have Spanish captions, and that although more translations are needed uh, and may come in the future, um, that's the only option. But just to know that that's an option for our students that would benefit from that. And then Hara, Harun, sorry, Harun, um, said that having, having some trouble with students doing the homework. You may have touched upon that actually, Cash, when you were talking about how you handle that and take the students outside and have them become self-aware. But if you have anything to add for Harun, that might be helpful. Yeah, it, it, it is a challenge um, to get students um, to do the homework. And I, I have so many students that will come in and work in class and they set big goals for themselves and they talk a big game about how they're going to do all, all this work. And then I, I just don't um, see any follow through. And so I, I, I think it's just good to keep having um, those conversations with the students. So I and this is just my philosophy of teaching. I, I don't try to approach those conversations like I'm the dictator. I don't try to approach it like I'm the all-knowing person. I just sit them down and say, hey, I, I see that that you're still class and and you know try to try to get the students to commit to it. so so what are your goals here? What you know when when do you want to test for the HSC? You know, how how far do you want to go in math and, and how can we come up with a um with with a plan to to get you there but to to, to be for perfectly um, frank, there, there are a lot of cases where it feels like I am beating my head um, up against a brick wall and, and getting nowhere. But, but just, just continuing to have those conversations and then um, just, just, just stick with it. it. It definitely is a challenge. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there was another comment just to share with you. It wasn't so much a question, but Barb was noting that this could be really helpful in workshop math settings, and especially if it's a multi-level group is what Tina had added. So some good conversations in the chat going on there. Um, I had a question, actually. Um, since we focused on math, I'm wondering if in your research you noticed if the Emporium model could be used in other content areas. I... I'm hesitant in terms of in terms of using it in other um, in other content areas. Um, I know there there have been uh, I, I've come across some programs where, where they use it in um, reading and writing um, kind of classes, but I'm not as familiar with those um, programs they use. I'm um, I, I'm thinking of one uh, particular colleague who tried um, the, this type of format with reading and writing and and stand that this whole setting it's it's not a HSC setting um, but in this setting um, the students we, we can require them to purchase programs like Alex and uh, my my colleague was not satisfied with any of the programs out there that are available for this kind of format um, so yes it, it, it is um, 
possible to to use it with other subjects but from what i've read i'm not aware of a lot of people have done it well um outside of math but if you can come up with a method i mean that, that would be something great to to put together data on and, and share with people absolutely well thank you so much i think that's all the time we have for today you guys i don't see any new questions i want to thank each and every one of you for attending and for your questions and comments um, please be aware that we have one more session for our NMDELT conference today from 3 to 4 p.m. And we hope that you stay with us and join us when you are finished with this video either or the conference for the day, either whether you did it live or watch it after the fact has been posted. Uh, we ask that you do go ahead and fill out the evaluation form so that we can have some feedback on how this conference has been for you. So thank you, chat. Um, thank you very much, Cash. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody in the chat. And you have a good day.